Dr. Nestor Demianchuk is a faculty member in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Alberta. His clinical practice and research interests focus on maternal fetal medicine, and he has published numerous scientific articles on the topic of fetal development. Hi, Dr. Demianchuk. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm excellent. Thank you. And yourself? Oh, very good. Thank you very much for asking. Um, so, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for agreeing to appear on our ManyViews.com webcast today. Um, and uh, as you know, the topic of our discussion will be uh, fetal well-being. Um, now, I guess I just start out uh, this interview, uh, Dr. D, just by asking you, how exactly do you define uh, fetal well-being? That's a, that's a very interesting question. And I think we have to relate the fetal condition to our condition. How would we feel to say that we're feeling well? We're feeling well when we feel that we're in good health. We feel well when all of our, uh, uh, we have a sense of peace and calm within our bodies, when we're in an environment which is comfortable and not hostile. And I would think that the fetus would have that same sense. So when the fetus is in a sense of peace, where it's not overstimulated, understimulated, where its environment is comfortable, where it's receiving all the nutrients that it needs, where it has the fluid around it to protect it from the outside environment is comfortable, those are all the conditions that would say that it's comfortable and it's in a state of well-being. It's also a state of health in general terms, like you and I. If we're ill, we're uncomfortable. If we have an underlying disease, we're uncomfortable. It's the same condition for the fetus. If the fetus has a major abnormality, it would be uncomfortable. So it's not in a, in a state of well-being. If the fetus is um, in an environment where the mother is unhealthy and not providing for it the nutrients, the oxygen, the food, then it's not in, in a sense of well-being. So it's truly a, a sense of yin and yang, a little bit like we are as human beings. If we're in an environment that's comfortable and we feel healthy, we feel well. Okay, so it's uh, really many ways analogous to, um, like, as, you, as you said, our own feeling of basically well-being. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's a great way of putting it. Now, sort of um, as physicians, um, or as a physician, what sorts of methods or tools um, do you actually employ to help assess the well-being of a fetus? Again, that's a very good question, and we have to think about it in different time zones. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do different tests at different times to assess different things. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with the earliest ones that we do. As I mentioned to you, if we are normal, we don't have abnormalities, and we don't have any chromosomal abnormalities, what we call karyotypes, we would be comfortable, right? So one of the first tests that we can do is we can screen or we can test for uh, chromosomal abnormalities. Okay, so that's one test that we can do, and these are tests called amniocentesis, where we take a needle and we put the needle into the fluid that's around the baby, mm -hmm. and in that fluid there are cells that we can then take out, and in the cells there is the code of who we are. They're called chromosomes, DNA, genes, we've all heard those words. Um, and what we can do is we can analyze those tests and find out if the structure of those genes, of that DNA, is normal. So that's a simple way. We can achieve this testing by doing amniocentesis, which as I said, is poking a needle into the fluid and getting the cells that way. Or we can literally take a sample from the placenta. And literally, the placenta mirrors very much the structure from a cellular point of view of what the fetus is. So those are two simple tests that we can do early in the pregnancy for doing karyotyping. Mm -hmm. And also, some of those cells can be used not only for karyotyping, but if, for instance, uh, there is inherited diseases in the family that we can identify. Mm -hmm. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is an example, or if uh, Tay-Sachs disease, or some of the other inherited or inborn errors in metabolism, mm -hmm. and we know that that runs in the family, then we can ask specific tests on those cells to try to determine those inherent problems 
of uh, metabolism or whatever other disease that is inherited in the family. This is not done on a routine basis. It's only done in a very selective group of patients who have predisposition for those abnormalities. Okay. And then, as you go on in the pregnancy, uh, another very important test is, which is offered to every pregnant woman, is an ultrasound at around 18 to 20 weeks of pregnancy. Now, okay. the ultrasound is a tool, basically, where we use sound to get images of structures within the baby. And we try to ascertain two important things. Well, three. The first and most important one, is there any abnormalities that we can identify with the ultrasound that are not genetic, that are not chromosomal? And these are things like heart abnormalities, kidney abnormalities, open spines, you know, central nervous system abnormalities. So we do what's called an anatomic review of the fetus. The other thing that we do with the ultrasound is we try to identify if the environment around the baby is normal. So is the uterus normal? Does the placenta look normal? Is the amount of fluid around the baby normal? Are there things that deform the uterus, like fibroids that some women may have? Do, does the, the shape of the uterus look normal? We look also, and the third thing that I mentioned to you, is is the baby growing appropriately? Is the flow of blood going towards the baby appropriate. And this is another thing that we assess and we try to see if the size of the baby is what we would expect it to be for when we're scanning it. Is there an error in the dates? Did the mother get pregnant later or earlier than she thought? Or is the baby small because there's something underlying that's making it not grow properly? Okay. okay. Then we go to the next stage. The next stage really starts at around 25 or 26 weeks of pregnancy and onwards all the way towards the time of delivery. And that's what we term the time of viability. So we would only do the next series of tests I'm going to talk to you about at a time when we can act if the test is abnormal, because usually what that means is delivering the baby. So we wouldn't do a test that we can't act on. So you don't want to do a test on fetal well-being determined that the fetus isn't well, but you can't really do anything because the baby won't survive if you try to deliver it. So we only start the next series of tests at around 25, 26 weeks, which currently in our environment is considered viability. And those tests include the simplest one, which is fetal movement. We ask the mother to be very conscientious about the baby's activity. A baby that moves is usually healthy. healthy. If a baby is not moving, then we worry, is there something underlying that's causing the baby to not be happy and not be moving? It's like you and I. If we're sick, what do we do? We get into bed and we curl up and we don't move. If we're healthy, we're running, we're jumping, we're doing our shopping and we're active. It's the same thing for babies. So usually we recommend that mothers monitor fetal activity and they should feel a minimum of six movements in two hours. And if they have six movements in two hours, that usually tells us that the baby is probably in good condition. And if the baby is not moving, or if mother does not perceive at least six movements in a couple of hours, we ask her to come to the hospital to make sure that the baby is okay, because then we'll do the next set of tests. And the next series of tests is called a choice. We have something called a biophysical profile. Now, a biophysical profile is where we look at activity of the baby within the womb. We look at movement. How often is the baby moving during our examination? We're looking at the, risk, at the types of movement. Is the movement brisk? We call that tone. Because if you're sluggish, it's not good. But if you have nice crisp movements, that usually means that you're in good shape, that your central nervous system is responding appropriately. And then we look at baby's breathing. Even though there's no air around the baby, the baby does practice breathing and moving the fluid in and out of its lungs because it's important for the development of lungs and it's also in preparation for breathing when the baby does come up. But the babies breathe about 10% of the time, so it's not always there. And then the final test of the biophysical profile, which we do not always, but sometimes, is something called the non-stress test. 
And the non-stress test is a funny name, non-stress. Well, what does that mean? It means simply that we hook up the mother to an ultrasound apparatus that looks at the heartbeat of the baby and how it varies from second to second. We look to see if the baby's heart goes faster when the baby moves or does it slow down or does it stay always slow or always fast. And what that does is that the heart reflects basically the integrity of the baby's brain. We call that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Okay. So, like you and I, if we get excited, what do we do? Our heart rate goes up and we're ready to run. Mm -hmm. If we are depressed, if we have a lack of oxygen, if we are extremely ill, all of our systems slow down and we stay slow right? So our heart rate would be slow. Or if we have damage to our organs, for instance, cardiac damage, like a heart attack, well, your heart cannot respond. So it shows damage, so it's going to be a very low rate. So the non-stress test is a test that looks at how the fetal heart rate beats and how it changes from second to second in its rate. And it's really a reflection of how much oxygen and if there's any acid within the baby. It's called acidosis. Okay. 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 Then the other component, so this is the biophysical profile, which is a test we do. And when we do a biophysical profile, we often include another component, which I mentioned earlier, which is the fetal environment. So we look at the fluid around the baby. Is the baby pee? Because fluid is basically pee. Is there a normal volume? Is the size of the baby normal? Has the baby grown appropriately? Is there something that will reflect on a poor environment or a poor environment that's coming from the mother, if the mother is very ill? As an example, if she has asthma, severe asthma, she doesn't have good oxygen, good oxygen doesn't get to the baby, baby doesn't grow. What if the mother has severe bowel disorders like Crohn's disease or colitis? Well, she doesn't get a good absorption of the nutrients. The nutrients don't go to the baby, the baby doesn't grow. What if she has an underlying disease like hypertension and the blood vessels are very tight and it limits the flow, flow of blood towards the baby? And again, in that situation, you might have a situation where the baby is not grown. Mm -hmm. So that's one series of tests. Another series of tests that you can add now on top of that is to look at the flow of blood towards the baby. This is called Doppler flow studies. And what we look at is how much and how fast is the blood flowing from the mother into the baby and is the flow of blood within the baby distributed normally. For instance, if you're under stress, as I mentioned, if you see a bear coming at you, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? You're going to make all your blood flow go into your muscles so you can run as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, in a baby, if there's poor blood flow, the baby wants to protect itself and it's going to protect its most important organs, which are its heart and its brain. And it's going to let go its muscles and growing. It's going to try to protect its heart and its brain. There's going to be a redistribution of flow of blood towards the heart and towards the brain and less towards the periphery. And we can identify that by looking at the flow of blood within the baby. And that's called Doppler flow studies. Okay. And then we go to the next step. So this is all progressive. Mm -hmm. And then we only do the next steps. The steps before are abnormal. Oh, right? Okay. So it, they're sequential. So then the next step is, well, what if we're not sure? Let's say we get into a situation where we do all of our tests, our fancy tests, and we still are coming out with a kind of not clear situation, not a absolutely, you know, where it's straightforward. So what we can do is we can put the baby into a condition of stress and see how it responds. Okay? Okay. Mm. How's that? You know, so what can we do? We can give the mother contractions. And the contractions will squeeze the baby and it'll change the blood flow towards the baby. And we look to see how the baby responds to that stress situation. It's called the contraction stress test. Okay. So now it's not a non-stress test. It is a stress test. So it's like you when we want to find out if an individual, like an adult, is prone to a heart attack. What do we make that person do? We put that person on a treadmill and we find out how his heart or her heart responds to a condition of stress, like a treadmill. 
Well, it's the same thing for a fetus. We put the baby into a condition of stress and we see how the baby responds. And we control that condition. It's a controlled environment. Okay. If the baby does show any stress, well, we stop the test and do something with it. Mm -hmm. Deliver it as an example. So there's another example. So you can see that fetal evaluation and fetal assessment is varied mm -hmm. and it depends what we're looking for and what time in the pregnancy the baby is. Okay, sure. Um, uh, and it seems like, uh, you know, depending on, on the knee, we definitely have a comprehensive set of tools uh, that help us ma uh, make assessment of fetal well-being. Uh, Dr. D, I'd like to thank you very much for this very informative uh, talk on this very important topic. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Paul, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.